the Gemara asks, if, I'll start from the beginning, I don't know where we ended. Ibai Elihu. Lachim achmat atzman, odil malachim achmat avarachir. Okay, we're talking about things that are moist from their, from their, they, they themselves have inner moisture, or is it that, let's say, water got poured on them? Okay, what's the difference? Now, if you think about it, I assume the assumption is that once something dries out, it's no longer able to really burn so well, even though to a certain extent, we dry things out in order to burn. But I guess these substances, once they're dried out, they're kind of not usable anymore. So it actually makes sense that we'd be talking about that they're lachim achmat atzman and not just that they got wet, but then again, we also know that once things dry out, once they get moist again, theoretically, they go back to their original state. So anyway, that's the Gemara's question, Tashma. They try to learn it. They're going to try from two sources, and in the end, they're not going to really be able to get an answer. Lo b'tevim, v'lo b'zagim, v'lo b'muchim, v'lo b'asavim, b'zman she'en lachim. So now we have a list of the following items, the tevim, the straw or the hay, the zagim, the dregs of the grapes, the muchin, which is the material we were talking about, the woolly material, and not grass. Now, iyamar pishlama lachim machmat avar acher shakti. Makes sense, because all these things, just like anything really, can get wet from something else. And la iyamar lachim machmat atzman, but if you're going to say they have their own internal moisture, muchin lachim machmat atzman hechem ishkachala. This woolly substance or material doesn't actually become moist from, it's not, there's no inner moisture to it, inherent moisture. So what does the Gemara answer? No, you could still answer that. Mimarte de bene antme. Comes from the animal, and the animal has sweat. And if, if you take the, the wool from the area that's between the legs, then you'll end up with, like you, it could be actually moist from within itself. The Hadzitani Rabbi Yashaya, so now they bring another source of Rabbi Yoshaya. He brings a bright that says one can insulate using dry, clo uh, dry cloth or peyrot yveshin or dried fruits, but not ksut lecha, not uh, clothing that's wet, moist, and not peyrot lachin, and not moist fruits. So again, they're going to say the exact same thing. And again, they answer me, Marta de Bain, No, again, this material comes from an animal and therefore it could be actually moist. Okay, new Mishnah. And from here, we're going to get into a very famous, interesting story. Um, we'll see where that takes us. So now we're getting the list. If you remember, we started out the Mishnah. Right? From which do we... Um, what do we use for insulating what can't we? And then we went through the list of what we can't. Now we're back to the list of what you can use. So you can use, and this is some of the ones just mentioned a second ago, which is you can use clothing and payroll, fruits, confeyona, wings of doves. We'll get back to those wings of doves. Ubenisoret shel harashim. This is the, the sawings of the carpenter, like little pieces. Ubena oret shel pishtan, also the little pieces of the flax. Um, daka, if they're small pieces. Rabbi Yehuda oser b'daka u'matir b'dasa. Rabbi Yehuda says, no, the little ones are problematic, the big ones are okay. So now we're gonna, um, we're gonna go off on a total tangent, and the Gemara is gonna say, Amar Rabbi Yanai, tefillin tzrichim guf naki, okay, really out of left field. When you wear tefillin, you have to have a clean body. We'll talk about this in a minute, what this means. Ke'elisha ba'al knafayim, just like Elisha, the one who had wings. Okay, sounding even weirder, right? First tefillin, where does that come from? Second of all, Elisha had wings. Who is this Elisha who had wings? What are we talking about? So the Gemara says, first ask, Mayhi, what is this guf naki that we're talking about? Abai yama shelo yafiach behem. Abai says, so that you don't flatulate while, you, while you're wearing them. Rav amar shelo yishan behem. You shouldn't fall asleep while you're wearing your tefillin. So Rashi says, what's the issue with falling asleep? So he brings it back to the first issue. He says, if you fall asleep, right, Shema Yafiach, same issue, basically. It's just that the Ritva explains what's Rashi's, how does Rashi understand Rabbah? That we're not really concerned that is, theoretically, if you know you need to flatulate, so what should you do? Hold back for a minute, take off your tefillin, and then you can. And that's one option. And Rabbah thinks that that's a reasonable option, and therefore he doesn't say, that you really needs guf naki because in other words, you can control that. But, um, but what he is concerned is that you might fall asleep because people are more likely 
to not be able to control falling asleep, I thought this would be a good experiment to try. Is it really true that people can control themselves more not to fall asleep than to be able to hold in if they need to flatulate? So anyway, interesting um, two opinions here. So basically there's a concern, right? That's our, that's our base, basic concern. So now they say, Vamai Karli Baal Knafayim. Now, why is he called Alicia Baal Knafayim? What is this? So now we're gonna hear a story about this. Uh, oh, by the way, another thing I didn't mention, Rashi says, um, He brings up this carry issue. But maybe you'll see, maybe you'll have a, a seminal emission. Uh, let me just read all of Rashi. What it's basically saying is, if you don't think you can control either of these things, then you shouldn't wear it to fill it. Okay, that's, that's what it, the bottom line of this sugya is. And Rashi brings up the carry and a bunch of the Rishonim say, what, what's he talking about? Nobody ever said there was an issue with carry while you have tefillin on. It's Shemi Yafiyak, we understand it brings a bad smell. This goes back to what we've been talking about and it's disrespectful. But it's not clear that carry is necessarily, although Rashi does have it there. So now we get to Alicia Bal Knafayim, and we're going to get back to the Guf Naki because there's very interesting stuff that comes out of this, um, but we'll get back to that soon. So one time the Romans had one of their Xerot where they forbade all Jews to wear tefillin, and if you wear tefillin, they're going to not get... Um, What's the word? The nakir is what a bird does, which is, by the way, is very interesting. You can see how these stories have a literary structure because he's called the Baal Knafayim, someone who has wings, and we're going to see the wings of the dove are going to come up here, which is, in case you were wondering what this story is doing here, since we talked about wings of a dove, we're going to get back to the wings of a dove. Um, so basically, they're going to knock out your brain if you do this, okay? But again, the linakir in Hebrew is a word that means it's what a bird does. So it's very interesting because they're connecting with the idea of the bird. Elisha didn't care. He said, I'm going to wear my tefillin and I'm going to even go out in public wearing my tefillin. So a Roman soldier sees him. So he starts running away. And the Roman starts chasing him. The Roman actually catches up to him. So he quickly takes off his tefillin and he puts them in his hand. I don't know how you do that with the straps and how he's able to do that super quickly. But anyway, quickly, that, that's not the most surprising part of the story. So he picks them up and puts them in his hand. Comes the Roman officer and he says to him, um, What are you holding in your hand? He says, Oh, I'm holding wings of a dove. He opens his hands, and lo and behold, right, first magic trick. It's always a bird that comes flying out, right? And here come the wings of a Yonah. It's not so clear if it was actually a Yonah that came out, or it was just the wings, but turns out he had Kanfei Yonah in his hands, and a miracle happened, and he was saved. Now we finally understand why he was called Elisha Baal Knafayim, right? He is the owner of the wings, right? He has wings, meaning these wings saved him in this miraculous story. Okay, last part of the Gemara before we try to make some sense of what exactly is going on here and raise a lot of questions. I won't promise to answer all of them, but I will raise a lot of questions. How are the wings of a dove different from the wings of all other birds? Because the Jewish people are compared to a Yonah. In other words, why was that chosen? Apropos Yom HaTzmaud and the Semel HaMidina with the wings of of, of a dove, you know, the, the symbol of a dove. So why is, what's so unique about the wings of a dove? Shene'emav, kanfei yonah nechpa bekeset. Okay, this is a pasuk in Tehilim, which says that the kanfei yonah are covered with gold, uh, with silver, and then it says with gold. Ma yonah knafei miginot aleha, av Yisrael mitzvot miginot alehen. Just like the wings of the dove protected, likewise the Jewish people are protected by mitzvot. Okay, so let's start our questions from the back and then go from the last part and then we'll go backwards. So the first thing is, what is unique about wings of dove? I looked it up because I wanted to understand better. Is there something specifically unique about the wings of a dove? So what I found is basically that a, that a dove doesn't have any other means of defense or offense or anything. The only thing the dove has is its speed. 
That's what it, which it does with its wings. And the other unique thing about the dove's wings is when the dove takes off and lands, it makes a very loud noise. And what I saw about it was some people think that that's actually their way of warning others, it makes this warning sound to kind of warn about trouble. Um, and, but in any case, the main thing is that it doesn't, it's not just that the wings protect it, but it's that, because theoretically you could say any bird's wings may be protect, but it's that it's the only means of protection it has. And what they're trying to say is that the Jewish people only have mitzvot to protect them. That's the only real thing that we have that protects us. Otherwise, we're kind of indefensible. It's a little bit like the Pasuk in Dvarim, where it talks about that we're dependent on God because we don't have water, natural water in Israel, and we have to depend on God for the rain. It's kind of the same thing, this idea that our protection comes directly from God, which is you know, both a challenge, but also it means we do have a way of protection, and that's our method. Let's go back. Where do we get this from? Well, this is in the story. What protected Elisha? His, his mitzvah. However, there's a bit of a problem with this story because what got him into trouble? His mitzvah, right? By doing the mitzvah, he actually got himself into trouble. So while it's true the mitzvah saved him, the mitzvah also ended up, um, the mitzvah also ended up protecting him, but it also got him into trouble. So now, the whole question really with this, Tosfa goes into two interesting directions, and I want to take that. So I see someone wrote about people used to wear tefillin all day, and I'm going to get back to that. That's a very important point today. So Tosfa at the bottom of the page basically starts asking the question that in Sanhedrin, it says that malchut afilu al mitzvah kala al Even on a small, any small mitzvah, when people are trying to stop you from keeping your religion, you can't even stop doing, right? You have to keep everything, and if they tell you not to do something, well, you even have to be moser nefesh, okay? Let yourself die, let yourself be killed for. So how is it that he took off his tefillin? So tell us what answer is that that's different. There, they're talking about Yerei Val Yavor, where they make you do something. Here, it's just that he just didn't put on tefillin. Now, it's taking off your tefillin is not an avera. It's not, right, he was wearing the tefillin and he took them off. That's not an issue. So that's one point. But in the first, in the earlier Tosfot on the page, Elisha Bal Knafayim, he starts bringing up a lot of issues. First of all, the biggest question of this sugya is really at the beginning. The sugya starts off and says, guf naki Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but in the story, it never actually says anything about Elisha having a guf naki. So what, what's the connection between this? So basically, Tosfot says, We can assume that since a miracle happened with Tfilin, through the tefillin that he was wearing, he must have been keeping his tefillin with the gufnaki, and he must have been very careful about it. And then Tosfot says, and for, for this reason, we can't say, basically Tosfot wants to suggest, that people might think that you shouldn't wear tefillin if you can't keep a gufnaki, because it's so complicated, it's so hard. And yet, he says, that's not, it's not so complicated, he basically says. So he says, don't think that because you need a gufnaki, you shouldn't wear tefillin. And by the way, this is one of the reasons, if we're talking about women's issues, there's a whole debate about whether women can wear tefillin or not. And one of the reasons why is generally women did not wear tefillin. There were other mitzvot, asay, shazman, grama, that were time dependent that women took upon themselves. This is not one of them. And why was this not one of them? And some of the people say, because they can't keep a gufnaki, or maybe because they menstruate, they, they naturally don't have a gufnaki, although that doesn't necessarily seem connected to gufnaki. Um, but because it's complicated to keep a goof in a key, therefore only those who are obligated should and not women. It's one of the reasons. It's not the most convincing answer, but it is one of the mitzvot. But the really interesting part comes with what Tosfot says now. So if you look at the sixth line in Tosfot, he says, And don't be surprised by the fact that a lot of people don't keep this mitzvah. And we're going to see why from this story. Okay, why? So they quote, first of all, what does it mean people, a lot of people don't keep this mitzvah? So basically, and I, I've actually found a really interesting article um, in Hebrew by Menachem Bromfman. It's in Ale Sefer. You can find it online, um, A-L-Y Sefer, S-E-F-E-R.com. And he basically does a whole analysis. He, he did, does research. He did research into were people keeping the mitzvah of Shfilin throughout the generations. And he basically brings a lot of sources like this one that Tosfot's quoting. Tosfot's actually quoting a Gemara, which we're going to see later in the Masechet, that basically says that people weren't keeping this mitzvah so much 
And there the Gemara says, okay, skip a few lines, says, Rabbi Shem ben Elazar says, Kol mitzvah shalom asu atzman Yisrael aleha b'sha'at kizera malchut kigon tefillin, adayin haya rifuya b'yadam. And that they learned from this story. Oh, with the mitzvot that don't keep up, people can't keep up with, are the ones that, that the people weren't most nefesh for. And what do you see here? Elisha Ba'ak Nafayim was unique. He seems to be the only one wearing tefillin. So you see from this story that people weren't doing it. And if people don't, now how do you read this? If people don't take a mitzvah seriously enough that they're going to do it, even in the time, right? You think about lighting candles and all those people in Russia who would light candles in their closets or something. And people really do still light candles. It's one of those things that if people really um, put, or most are nefesh and they do whatever they can to keep this mitzvah, it's going to last. Just like Brit Milah, circumcision. It's one of the mitzvahs that the majority of Jewish people do. But tefillin is not one of them. And, and it's something that throughout the generations, and it seems like even more so than nowadays, then really people weren't wearing tefillin. And um, there's even sources that say, maybe you should only wear them on a seret yimei tshuva. And, and it's very strange because we look at tefillin as if it's pretty basic, right? There are definitely, it's not as high a percentage as circumcision, but there is certainly within the religious Jewish world, it's very, very accepted mitzvah. And in these sources, it seems like it wasn't necessary. So he offers some suggestions. One of the things being about the fact that they used to wear tefillin all day. And that once they dropped tefillin to only for davening, and as you can see, just for davening, it's not so difficult to keep a gufnaki, but if you're going to wear them all day, it's much more complicated. And once they changed that, so that also changed the, the perspective. And the other, uh, he brings a few other things. Another one is that maybe people viewed tefillin like tzitzit. Tzitzit, really, nowadays people say, oh, you have to wear tzitzit, but theoretically, it's only if you have a four-cornered garment are you really chayav the tzitzit. So some people viewed it only if you actually have tefillin do you have to wear tefillin, which is a little bit strange. Um, uh, people bring up other issues, like it, there were debates about how exactly to do the batim, and therefore maybe they didn't want to do it wrong, they make a bracha la batala. I don't know if those are so convincing, but also another very convincing answer, and someone asked me this about um, two months ago, maybe. She said, how is it that people could afford tefillin? It's so expensive tefillin to make, and how could it be that everybody was wearing tefillin? And one of the proofs that maybe that this was the issue is very likely that it was financial, and people couldn't afford tefillin, and they couldn't make them. It was very expensive to make. And not everyone was able to have them. So that could also be another reason. So it could be financial reasons. Again, I told you I'm going to raise a lot of questions. I don't really have the answers for all this. Um, just the interesting thing at the end of Tess, when he brings up a non sequitur, he talks about some other sorts that you might think that people weren't keeping the mitzvah of Tefillin Mishum Mipnei Ramaim. But he reinterprets that source. He says it's not that they weren't keeping Tefillin because of Ramaim. It's not so clear. Ramaim are people who trick others. And then he explains what they're talking about there. And they give this story of, Somebody gave his money to someone who was wearing tefillin, and the people wore tefillin to kind of show, oh, look, I'm Jewish, or I'm really, you know, and, and you can trust me. And actually, they were, they were lying. And that you, but the Ramaut here is don't trust people just because they wear tefillin. Okay, don't just assume. And by the way, I wanted to quote, I put it on the sheet. If you have the sheet, so the Meiri writes here, it's right in the center of the first side of the sheet, or a little more toward the top. He says, Tfilin sarich hanosam liyot naki, okay, he talks about this guf naki, but he switches it. Naki me'averot u'mihurhurim ra'im. Naki of sins. Ad shelo yitchalel shem shamayim al yado liyot rasha v'tzurat sadiq. Don't wear your tefillin and think that you can look like a good person, but do bad things or have bad thoughts. It's a very powerful line. And he says, you know, you should be someone who's mitatef v'tzitzit u'miniyach tefillin and holech v'mirameh tabriyot v'nitza shem shamayim l'sheke. Right, and this is, and that is a possible approach also as to why maybe people got scared when they read something like this or they thought about something like, maybe I can't keep myself up to that standard and therefore didn't. In any case, it's a historically very interesting thing that tefillin were not widely um, worn for many generations. Okay, we're going to move on um, to the next part. So we're now four lines, five lines before the mission starts. Benesorat Shel, or six lines, Benesorat Shel Parashim. Okay, this is the carpenter's um, shreds, or I, don't, I can't think of the right word. Ibai Elihu, Rabbi Yehuda, and Benesorat Shel Parashim Kai, or an Oret Shel Pishtan Kai. Is he talking about the carpenter chips, or is he talking about the flax 
pieces, the small pieces of flat. So when he says daka, it's forbidden, but kasa is okay. So which one is he referring to? Tashma, let's learn from here. We bring a bride to where it seems very clear. The, the parts that come from the flax, if it's small pieces, it's like the zevel. What's the zevel? That was in the category of things that even when they're moist, right? That was uh, the zevel was in the first category. That even when they're dry, you can't do hatmana. So shmamina and oret shal pishtan kai. So it must be that was what he was referring to. That the ones that are daka are forbidden for, um, and that it was only on the oret shal pishtan and not on the sawdust. Thank you for those who provided the word for me. Uh, okay, new Mishnah. Tomim bishlachin umetaltalinotam. Bikizet semer ve'emetaltalinotam. Again, we're going to see the crossover between hatmana, insulating, and muktza. Why are these connected? Because if it's an item, and thank you to Julie for yesterday pointing out about the after class about the Lishanochal Argaman and the thought of taking these purple dyed materials and using them for purposes of Hatmana is basically insane because they were incredibly expensive and very hard to come by and it doesn't make any sense anyone would use them, which very much explains the muksa issue, which means right, if no one's going to use this for that, then of course they're going to be muksa. So now they say we're going to distinguish between the hide of an animal and between the gizet semer, the wool, because the wool is really not generally used for this. And therefore, wool cannot be moved, but it's moksa, but the hide of an animal could be moved. So besides, both of these are allowed for hatmana purposes, but even if you use the gizet semer for hatmana purposes, you actually can't move it because it's still moksa. So now there's going to be a bit of a problem. Well, if you do hatmana, and you insulate your food with this item that is now looked at, how on earth are you going to get your food out? So, Ketzaduo, so what's he supposed to do? Notele takisoi vehe no You pick up the cover of the pot, which presumably either, now we talked about, insulated could be on all four sides, so maybe the pot cover is sticking out a little bit, and then you just pick it up and everything, and that's what we call tiltum in atzad, right? You don't actually touch it yourself, just falls aside. And the second thing is, um, it could be that it wasn't insulated on the top, and therefore the cover was easily accessible. So, Notel is like he's over here float, that's his option. Rabbi Lazar ben Azari Omer, Kupa Matel Tzida ben Notel Shema Yitol ben Inoya Falachzir. There becomes this other issue, which is lots of times you might take the food out that you insulated, and you might want to leave some in there or put it back in there after you've finished. You might not finish everything, and you might want to leave it there for later. So how are you supposed to do that? So if, you have a, if it's in a uh, type of box, then you tilt it on its side, and then you take what you want, and so that you can be able to put it back since you can't actually move the insulated items. The Chachamim Amlim no telu machzir. He said, no, it's not a problem to put it back. We don't have an issue. The Gemara is going to later explain that. We're not going to even get it today, to it today, what the Machloket is about. Now we're going to have um, a story of a few rabbis sitting together in a discussion that they had. It's not exactly a story, but it's while they were sitting, they had a discussion about this, and then we're going to get off on a tangent into some other discussion they were having about something else Shabbat-related, but really not related to our issue. Yatav Rabbi Yonatan ben Achinai, the Rabbi Yonatan ben Elazar, the Yatav Rabbi Hanina bar Chama Gabayi. So these rabbis were sitting together, and they asked the question, Shlachim Shabbat Abayi, Tanan, when the Mishnah says that these hides of animals that you have, they're not muktza, besides the fact that you're allowed to use them for hatmana purposes, for insulating, they're also not muktza. Why are they not muktza? The assumption is, and we've talked about this before, people sometimes use them, they put them on a couch to sit on, a covering for something, they're reusable items. But are we only talking about the average hide that you would have in your house, that's a regular hide, but not if you were a tanner and this was your business. Because if you're a tanner and this is your business, well then your business property, you're not going to use on Shabbat for anything. So do we say, Shaluman, of uh, 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 someone who this is their business, a tanner, Kevan de Kapiralai, since he cares about them, and is very particular about them, Lomatatalinamahu. Odilma, or do we say, Shaluman's not, no, the Mishnah was actually telling us, even if you're an Oman, the kosher can, and obviously then balabai. So Amar Rabbi Yonatan ben Alazar, we're going to have two answers. Okay, 
the obvious two answers. One's going to say yes, one's going to say no. It would seem more logical that the Mishnah was talking about just a regular person and not someone who this was their business. So Rabbi Hanina Barhama pipes it. Rabbi Shmael, the son of Rabbi Yossi, he told me, He said, My father was a tanner. And he would say on Shabbat, Come bring out the mats and the hides, and we're going to all sit on them. So, what do you see here? Obviously, that they did use them, and therefore they can, they're, they're not mukhtan on Shabbat. Now, I want to ask you to think about this for a minute. Do you think that that's a good proof? Do you think the best kind of proof is from someone? At first glance, you would say, oh, it's awesome. We have a proof from someone who is in the business, right? Much better when you have someone who actually knows what they're talking about. And here you have actual proof. They use them, and therefore that's great proof. However, we know that if you study the human behavior, human behavior varies among many people. And just because he was in Uman, a tanner, who actually used his his uh, materials on, on Shabbat or any time during the week, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody would, right? You can imagine there's people who are more particular with their items and people not. So it's sometimes a little bit tricky to take, right? You would say, let's do a survey of all the tanners in the neighborhood or all the tanners in different neighborhoods and let's try to really figure out what's the, what's the behavior, the average behavior of a tanner. So taking one person's example on the one hand sounds great, on the other hand, not so clear that that's the best way of proving it because it really could be he was just particularly he didn't care he was much more lax about it. Anyway, we have these two approaches: is Uman allowed or is Uman not allowed? We're now going to have a question from a brayta on the ones who allow it. Mated it, misarim shabalabayit, the sawdust of a balabayit. I'm sorry, these are not the sawdust. The, I was confusing the words for a second. The um, the boards, boards of a balabayit. Okay, he has some wooden boards in his house. Mital talinotan. You can carry those, you can move them, because the assumption is, right, wooden boards are usable for all sorts of purposes. So, uman eimetatolinotam. But if you have wooden boards and this is your business, you can't carry them. So here it seems pretty clear that you can't carry things that belong to an uman, because he's particular about it. Let's keep going, though. But if you plan to use it as his table, ben kaku ben Then it doesn't matter, even if you're an uman, once... This again goes back to your intent. Mukt is all about your intent. And if you intend to choose them for some other purpose, then it's fine. So what do you see here? An Uman you can't use unless he designates it. So what do they answer? Shani Nisarim de Kapitalai. You know, you can distinguish between the hides of animals, which don't get ruined very easily, versus the wooden boards, which can get dented, can get dirty, something can happen to them. And therefore, you can't necessarily prove it from here. Tashma, let's bring another source. This source is actually going to prove, or at least attempt to prove, the lenient opinion. The first one was questioned the lenient opinion. Now we're going to try to prove it. If you have hides, whether they are processed or tanned, or whether they're not tanned yet, what's the issue? Before they're tanned, they're actually not necessarily, they're not usable yet. But you can still... Okay, the assumption is they're still, well, let's say, put it this way. I want to be clear about my wording. We're going to talk about this as it relates to Choma. This is going to be a little easier. When we talked about Choma, we said that in order for a Kli to be susceptible to impurity, it has to be called a Kli, has to be already a finished product. In order to say something's not Muktza, it doesn't have to be a finished product because even if it's unfinished, you might actually use it for something. So the criteria for carrying are just that it be usable. The criteria for purity and impurity is that it actually be finished, a finished product. So therefore, whether they're tanned or whether they're not tanned, you can actually move them on Shabbat because the assumption is you can use them for something. Lo Amur Abu Din, when they use the criteria that has to be processed, it has to be tanned, that's only le'inyan tuma bilvat. Only for purposes of impurity does it actually need to be a full product. So now, how do they learn from here anything? Well, they say, notice the distinctions they make. My love, Los Nasha Balabai, Los Nasha Uman. They just said very simply, you can carry them. It didn't start to distinguish whether it belongs to a, a regular person or a craftsman. So, Los Nasha Uman, Los Balabai, and Los So, they basically assume it's, since they don't distinguish, it must be okay. So, now they say, wait a minute. Avash Uman, my. Aim it out to them. One second, Los Nasha Balabai, Los Nasha Uman. Ah, sorry. I skipped three words that were very important. 
So then the Gemara says, Lo shalvala bayit. The Gemara says, no, you could just assume that they're referring to tanned pieces of uh, hide that belong to a balabai. They weren't talking about an uma. So now the Gemara says, aval shal uma mai. So what are you trying to say then about a craftsman's, um, about a tanner's hide? My aim at Taltalin, you want to say basically, right, according, if you're going to read that that source was only about uh, a regular person and that an uman cannot be carried, ihachi ha detane velo ambu abudim elalin and tuma bilvad liflok belitne bedida. We've seen this many times where they say, well, once it already started to make distinctions between tuma versus uh, tiltul. Once they're already distinguishing there, they should have right there jumped in and said, Bamed what hides are we referring to? Uman, lo. Should have jumped in and specified them. We're only talking about the Balabayat, but not Shal Uman. So what did they answer? No, Kula Babalabayat, Kamari. No, very simply, you could just say, they, it didn't even dawn on them that you were talking about Shal Uman. The whole topic there was, hides of a Balabayat, what can you do with them? Can they become impure? Can they can you use them on Shabbat? It had nothing to do with an uman, and that just wasn't the nose, and that's why they didn't mention it, and therefore you can't really learn anything from the source. So we don't really have a way to learn anything. The only thing they're going to end with, which they're not going to reject, and you know they're not going to reject this because it doesn't say lema kitanai, it just says kitanai. Kitanai means it's actually a makhloka tanaim. So not only were these emoraim debating this issue, but even the tanaim before them debated this issue. Here we have a source, and you'll be interested to know who appears on the makhloka here. That's Tanakama. Rabbi Yossi Omer, why is that interesting? Because he was the tanner, remember. So he specifically says, Again, this is, if you want to take what I was talking about even farther, here you see that when rabbis or anybody in something or makes a decision about anything in life, and it doesn't just relate to psikat halacha, it relates to anything, we all take our life experience with us, and that affects how we view things. So here, he took his life experience, and he said, ah, so my view of halacha is through my, my view of doing this. Again, whether we really don't know whether he was reflective of the behaviors of all the tanners in those days, or maybe he was unique and we don't really know. By virtue of the fact that there's a different opinion, might actually prove that he wasn't, he, he was maybe somewhat unique in his approach. Um, which is also, if you think about it, in terms of the sugi, if you want to say, oh, look, not only were the Amoraim debating this, also the Tana'im, but the Tana'im, the Amoraim were using these same Tana'im as the source of their, of their opinion. So it's not necessarily even to say, you know, oh, look, they were talking about it, and they were talking about it. It's all really coming from the same source. But now, since we were talking about these rabbis sitting together, they now tell us, So these rabbis continued sitting together and had another question. When I mentioned in the beginning of the Mesechet, I said this really is how the Mesechet should have started out, and we had to wait till Ayin Gimel to get there. But now they're going to say, um, we'll at least get a sneak preview right now. We still have another 24 Dapim to go. But when they say that there's 20, there's 39 Melechot, Kineged me. Who are these Melechot Kineged? Why 40? How, uh, actually 39, right? They say 40 minus 1. Uh, we'll talk about that later, why they, why they word it like that. It's like Malkot is also 40 minus 1. But 39 Malachot, where we get 39 from? Amar lehu Rabbi Hanina bar Chama. Remember, he was the one who answered before. Kin neged avodot mishkan It's the work that they did in the Mishkan. I think we mentioned this once before, but I'll mention it again. There's a big debate about the work they did in creating the Mishkan, building the Mishkan, or the work, does it also include the work they did when they transported the Mishkan through the desert? Amar lehu Rabbi Natan bar Rabbi Elazar. It's actually because of the words melacha, melachto, and melechet in the Torah, they appear in 39 places. So, this is an interesting one. We're going to see, first of all, right, this is for our modern rational eye, this seems like a very strange proof, right? Although we've been learning enough Gemara that you understand that they do all sorts of proofs like this. Again, one could say that maybe there was this understanding that we don't really understand anymore about a way of learning the Torah of kind of counting words and how this, um, you know, I admit that I don't really relate to it as much, but I also admit that we might not understand so well where this is coming from. So they basically say, because that word appears 39 times in the Torah, that's our proof. 
That's where we get to 39. So by Rav Yosef, now they start asking questions about these psukim, because in fact, Melacha, Melachto, and Melechet uh, appear more than 40 times, more than 39 times in the Torah. They're going to ask about one specific one by Rav Yosef. The Pasuk about Yosef, when he comes back home to Isha Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, and she tries to seduce him, it says there, he, when he came home, is that part of it or not? Is that, what was he doing? What's the malachah really that he was doing? So So he says, let's take out a Sefer Torah and start counting the words, right? It, it sounded like first they kind of took it as, oh, it must be there. But then someone realized there's something wrong with the count. And he says, let's take out the Torah. Milo Didn't a similar situation happen about a totally different topic? Where they were having a discussion about something, and Rabbi Rabbi said, "Name Rabbi Yochanan lo zazu misham achi di yisro patora umenatun." They had a debate about this, and they didn't move until they found a sefer Torah. They started counting all the words, and they went through. Right? They didn't have Safari or computers. You know, they were able to do these searches like we could do today. So now he says, "Amarle ki kamisakali mishum dichtiv hamalachai tadayan miminyanehu v'hal kemanda amar la sotzrachav nichnas." He says, I know how many words there are, but my question is this. I know that there's a problem because I know that there's an extra one. And the question is, which one is the one that we take out? Is it the one that's, um, is it the one about Yosef? Or is it the one at the end of the Mishkan when it says, Hamilachai Tadayam, the work was finished. Okay, so now, how do we say this? If you say Hamilachai Tadayam is part of the count, then what do you say about Yosef and his Malacha? Ha Kemandamar la Sotrachav Nichnas, he was actually going home to go to the bathroom. He wasn't actually doing malacha. The Torah uses the word malacha, but that he wasn't going to work, and therefore the word malacha there doesn't mean work, and that's why it's not in the count. But we do not, or do we say, There it's just telling us the work was finished, but it's not actually talking about work that's being done. It was saying, oh, and now they were finished. So the word work there isn't so important. And the Gemara answers our obvious answer for this kind of question. Take it, we don't really know, okay? But they were having this discussion, trying to figure out which was the word or not. Now the Gemara goes on to bring a bright to support the opinion about Kineged Avodot HaMishkan, which is the more famous one. That's the one we normally hear. Obviously, even if you say Kineged Avodot HaMishkan, we still have to get to the number 39, because how you do that count and how they knew, it's not like there's a list in the Torah of every malacha they did in the Mishkan. So you're still going to have to come up, and, and it could be that there's some sort of combination of these approaches. The melacha, melachto, melechet comes to teach you how many melachot there were, and then they come up with the 39 melachot based on that. But they're all connected to the Mishkan. And then he's the really right to support this connected to the Mishkan. You're only obligated if you do a melacha like they did in the Mishkan, and they're going to bring us a few examples. Heim zavu, they planted, ba'atem lo tizlu, and therefore you can't plant. Heim katzlu, they harvested ratem lo tikatsu. Heim ha'elu atakrashim mikar kalagala. They, we've learned this in the, before when we were learning about Rishuyot on Shabbat. They took the boards, the wooden boards, from the ground to the wagons. Ratem, this was to move them, by the way, in the desert. This would prove that, that opinion, unless you say somehow it was also during the building they did this. Ratem lo tachnisu mirishut ha'avim lirishut ha'achit. Since they took them from the ground, which is public, and they put them in the wagon, the wagon was considered a rishut ha'achit. Therefore, we can't do that. Heim ho ridu et hakrashim me'agala lekarka, v'atem lo tutsim rishit ha'achid lirishit ha'avim. They also took the boards from the wagon onto the ground, so we can't also take from a private domain to a public domain. Heim ho tziu me'agala lagala, this is an interesting one, they moved from wagon to wagon, which is rishit ha'achid to rishit ha'achid, v'atem lo tutsim rishit ha'achid lirishit ha'achid. Now, the immediate question, if you remember from the beginning of Shabbat, and if not, it's good review, rishit ha'achid, my, it's actually not a problem, Mida to do that. So how could you say that that's what they did? So you know, it means they passed it through Rashid Arabim from Rashid to Rashid through Rashid Arabim. That's actually a problem. Okay? And that's why that, um, that's what they're talking about. Okay. We ended up with a very interesting uh, story with a really nice message. It'll be a good message to take you through Shabbat. The Giz Eit Semach Eimetaltolim. So now we say that you can't, um, you can't move these Giz Eit Semach, even though you could use them for insulating, but they're mukta. These are the woolen pieces of wool. Amarada, 
Rebbe says in the Beit Midrash, Loshanu ela shalo tamam behem. This is only if you didn't use them for insulating. About tamam behem metaltaliyotam, but as soon as you use them for insulating, what do you show? That you obviously want to use them on Shabbat. And, there, and remember, hatmana has to be done before Shabbat. You can't do it on Shabbat. So before Shabbat, you already are showing, I designated this for hatmana, and therefore you can carry them. Okay, now that sounds like a very good answer, a very good explanation, except it totally doesn't fit with our Mishnah. Because what did the Mishnah say? The Mishnah struggled with, if you did insulating, right, you insulated and you can't move it, so how do you get the food from inside? So, you would think Rabbi would notice this, but instead, who notices this? What is this? A first day in the Beit Midrash student asked Rabbi the following question. In other words, what is the Gemara trying to show you? Even someone who's never been in the Beit Midrash before, first day in the Beit Midrash, right, it's a great message to go home with, can have a great question and, and, and make Rabbi rethink what he was saying. Because what Rabbi said was very, very logical. It just doesn't fit in with the Mishnah. So Rabbi had a good line, but sometimes you don't remember everything and you need your students to come and say, wait, that doesn't make sense. And here it's trying to say that really anyone can answer, um, can basically ask good questions and affect the discussion and the, the conversation. So anyway, he says, says to him, Tomnim begizei tzemer ve'em etatzali notam ketzadu osei quotes our Mishnah. No tel etaki soi ve'en no flo. So it can't possibly be. So ela iitmar hachi itmar. So the shot of this line means well, it must be that Rabbi said something else. But that doesn't really make much sense because Rabbi clearly said that because the student answered him. They're going to reread Rabbi. But I looked up in the Dictu Kesel Frim. That's a book which basically tells you different versions and different manuscripts. And they actually take out the words in some of the manuscripts of Izmar, Hachi, Izmar. And it would make much more sense to read the Gemara like this. Ella, I'm a Rabbi. And other Rabbi changed what he wanted to say. And he said, Lo shanu ela shalo yichdan lahatmana. Aval yichdan lahatmana mitaltalino no, they were only talking about if you designate it in general to be used. And as if you used it on a one-off, that doesn't count. But if you designated it for use in general, then mital Okay, I'll leave you with one last thought. It's interesting here because what's he basically saying? The answer in the end is there's a difference between a one time and many times. And maybe he's using this as a way to encourage the student and say, it's nice you came one time and you had a great question but you really need to keep coming back again and again and again. And that that's maybe the idea of the message of this, you know, about the Yichdan. So on the one hand, it's awesome he came the first day and he got into things and had good questions, but really what they're trying to say is he's hinting to him, you know, you have to set, it, set aside your time. So for all those doing that, you're in a good place.